The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. In the epistles of Peter booklet, my father writes about Peter's reference there to the flood in Noah's day. It's referred to in both of his epistles, by the way. And uh, my dad was saying in the booklet how that uh, there's really two messages in that for us today. One has to do with what's soon to come upon this world, uh, not only in the lead up to the tribulation, but... uh, even after the millennium, if, as we know from, uh, I think it's Second Peter 3, about the, uh, the purge of this earth. But there's also a story in it about Noah himself, his family, and how that uh, in his day when society was about to uh, fall apart entirely, God intervened for him and for his family and saved him rescued him from sure destruction. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3 today to begin with. In the booklet it says, It's a message about the end of the world and man's rule on earth. It's about standing alone and using the power of God. So it's a message for this earth. It's a warning for this earth. And it's also instruction for us in that if we stand, even if we stand alone and use the power of God, God will look after us. God will provide for us. God will rescue us. God will help us. 1 Peter 3 here, verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So be ready to give an answer. And in the Peter booklet, It talks about just how many trials Peter himself was facing. He was facing a tragic death, in fact, physically speaking. And yet, he was filled with hope. His mind was on the future. His mind was on the next world, the world God was building. The world that God was preparing. Verse 18 says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ died for this world. And uh, yet, as we see over and again, repeatedly in the Scriptures, there's so few in this present evil world, as Paul called it, there's so few that are willing to respond to God's message today, now, in this evil world, and to come out of this world. It's not easy to stand for God and to represent this sure hope. But we can do it if we follow in Peter's steps and where you have this eternity-oriented focus, this vision of tomorrow. Verse 19 says, By which also he went and preached, this is speaking of Christ, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So this was the message that that, uh, Jesus proclaimed, even to those fallen spirits, those demons that followed after Lucifer and his rebellion. And Jesus, when he'd proclaim a warning to them even, mentioned this example of Noah. And if you look back at this history, it's incredible, really, to think that after just ten generations, ten generations removed from Adam, Society was the way that it was, as Genesis 6 describes. Their their minds were on evil continually, continually. Just ten generations later, of course those generations lived quite a lot longer than, than they do today, but still, verse 21, I'll read from the Revised Standard, it says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, notice the example or the analogy that Peter makes here, Baptism, speaking of or comparing it to the flood, it says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, 
and powers subject to him. So the flood, in other words, of Noah's day, typifies not only that fiery purge at the end of the world tomorrow or at the end of the great white throne judgment period, it also typifies our baptism, our coming out of this world, our putting to death the old man or that old society, and then coming forward into newness of life. You can read a lot about that in Romans 6 and other passages of Scripture, this new way of life. Let's go back, though, and look at that old society, the old world, Genesis chapter 7, the world that then was, as it's called in Scripture. Of course, the Bible speaks of three different worlds, that world before the flood, and then this present evil world, and then the world to come, the world tomorrow. And yet you just don't hear about that in religion today, those three worlds, and yet they're plainly described in the Bible over and again. Genesis chapter 7. Noah, if you think about it, Noah and his family, they uh, lived right through two different worlds. They were the transition. They lived in the old world, the world that then was. And then God, as you know, had them you know, take on this unusual <laughs> mission to construct this ark. And it was by this, this uh, boat that they were able to be transported into the next world, the new world. And there's some similarities there between Noah and his family. And of course, us today, we're drawing right near to the end of this age, as so many prophecies tell us. And many of you are going to transition right into the new world that Jesus Christ is about to set up. Genesis 7 here, verse 6 says, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. So God gave the people of Noah's day 100 years to think about their sins, to turn to God in repentance, to consider whether they would live differently after Noah's warning message. Verse 20, a little further down, it says, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered, and the waters, verse 24 brings out, the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So all the mountaintops were covered, and it lasted for 150 days. The earth was covered with water. Everything on earth was covered. Verse uh, 3 of chapter 8 says, And when the waters... And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. So they subsided sufficiently for the ark finally to ram into ground there at uh, undoubtedly at Mount Ararat in what is today Turkey, over in the Middle Eastern region. And this was the beginning of an entirely new and different world. I mean, obviously, this was the beginning of something different. The first father of this world that was established there right after the flood was Noah, a man who walked with God. If you think about it, if you compare him to the beginning with Adam, I mean, Adam was offered the opportunity to take from the tree of life, to receive of God's spirit, to walk with God, so to speak, but he rejected that opportunity. He turned away from God in sin and rebellion, and God cut him off from the tree of life. Noah, though, was different. Noah was converted. Noah walked with God. Look at verse 20 in this same chapter. It says, And Noah built an altar unto the eternal, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. He knew about God's laws. He followed God's instructions. Here is an individual who was submissive to God's authority, obedient to God's laws. What an attitude. What an opportunity for a new society to get it right. Verse 1 of chapter 9, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God blessed his family, and they started to produce, and they started to multiply. And Noah had a very righteous son named uh, Shem, so the 11th generation from the beginning. Down in verse 11 it says, And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy 
the earth. And so God made this everlasting covenant with Noah. You can read more about it in verses 16 and 17. And promised that there'd never be a flood like this again. Verse 20, just to hit a few high spots here. It says, and Noah began to be an husbandman and he planted a vineyard. And so here was, as I say, this civilization set up right after the flood. And uh, in so many ways, I mean, it was more ideal than even what God would set up later in the nation of Israel when he brought them out of captivity and set them up in their own land, in the land of milk and honey, the land of blessings. But here was a society that started with one man who was righteous and his family was blessed because of that man's obedience. Notice what Mr. Armstrong, Herbert Armstrong, writes in Mystery of the Ages. This is on page 170. He says, two requisites make a human whatever he becomes in life, heredity and environment. It says, heredity, if of good and high quality, may start uh, one off at an advantage, an inspiring environment, uplifting influences, and right self-motivation may further improvement. Such environment may turn one of inferior heredity into a real success in life. He's talking about ancient Israel in this case. Notice he says, God started his chosen nation off, even though brought out of slavery, with all the natural advantages of a superior heredity. God pulled them out of slavery and gave them a new and fresh start. One might say they had everything God given going for them. Now God, by doing this, as Mr. Armstrong goes on and explains in that book, he was doing it to make a point. He was doing it to show that even in the best of circumstances, even with the best environment, even coming from the best heredity, if we don't have God's spirit, if we don't have the mind of God, it still isn't going to work the right way. Man is incomplete of himself. God shows us that in the very first two chapters of the Bible. Man needs another spirit to combine with his human spirit in order to think like God, to behave like God. And so God was giving Israel, anciently, everything ideal to show us today that even with all of that, we still lack the component needed to be successful spiritually. Now, in the case of Noah, here was a man, as I say, who was righteous, who walked with God. God blessed him and his family after the flood. He was beginning, I mean, he himself and his family was starting a new civilization, a new world in this environment. The land, of course, had been given rest underneath the waters of this flood uh, and no doubt was rejuvenated because of it after those waters receded. The people, as we know, congregated around where the ark hit land uh, initially, but then they, they spread out from there. But initially, you would think that as they worked their way down the mountain uh, and built up communities around that mountain, that they'd be able to look at this mountaintop and, and the, the ark that was wedged into the top of it and, and view that as a permanent monument to what happened to the old world. To say nothing of the fact that Noah continued right on living for a couple of centuries after the flood. And the civilization started in the smallest of ways, just eight people. And then they started to multiply. Think of the lessons that would have been passed on if your dad was Noah, or if your granddad was Noah. The things that you would pass along to your children, the things that you would hopefully teach your children about that old world, and why it was submerged, and why the flood came, and what Noah did to rescue a civilization because of his faithfulness, his obedience. It was a pretty good start, in other words, to begin a society with Noah, of all people. Chapter 9, Genesis 9, verse 28, it says, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So he lived 350 years after Noah. 
the flood, and you think about the, the length of days for the United States, 235 years or so, Noah has outlived the United States by a long shot. I mean, he's, 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 he would have fought in the revolution and then be sitting here today to pass on some of the lessons that he learned from way back when. He lived right up until the birth of Abraham, of all things. This man, Noah, this great patriarch. Notice what Mr. Armstrong said. This is back in 1945 from a radio program. It says, after the flood, sent as a judgment to prevent men from destroying themselves through sin, one would think the few survivors would have learned their lesson. But it took only two generations to produce a man of ability and willingness and the ingenuity to organize society according to the selfish competitive principle. For as good as it started, in other words, it took just two generations for man to veer completely off course, to go it his own way, just like Adam and Eve had done and to set up a civilization based on the principle of get, based on the principle of take. By huddling thousands of families together, building cities, he found he could regulate the lives of those people, rule over them, speaking of Nimrod, of course, organize them into specialized production and distribution systems, and thus make multiple profits off the sweat of the labor of others, it says, Nimrod built the first city, Babylon, then Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna, from which, as we read in Genesis 10, he pushed out into Assyria, building the great city of Nineveh and its suburbs, and then still other cities. So here along comes Nimrod, who rejected the teachings of Noah, who rejected the teachings of Shem, and decided to organize a society around himself. Back in Genesis 8, Genesis 8 here in verse 20, it says, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. We read this a moment ago, but notice verse 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. He makes a little comment there about man's heart, just in passing, <laughs> how that it's uh, on evil from his youth. This is because of Satan the devil, the god of this world, who is broadcasting even when the circumstances, the environment, the heredity is ideal, physically speaking, Satan is still there. As long as he's on the throne of this earth, Satan will be broadcasting his message. And what God is telling us here in verse 21, he's basically saying, look, it's not going to take very long for man to revert back to his old ways because the God of this world is still of the God of this world. He's still on the throne of this earth. And until he's removed, the ways of man will persist along this selfish course, this vain course. The world, in other words, was still cut off from God, even though Noah was one exception, obviously. And there have been just a few exceptions down through the history that's covered in the Bible, just a few, but over and again, as I said at the start, the Bible speaks of just the very few that come out and the overwhelming majority that reject God's truth. Let's look at Acts chapter 3 here in conclusion. Acts chapter 3, as ideal as that post-flood world was there at the start, it still had Satan as its God, the world was still cut off from God. And as faithful as Noah was, as righteous as Noah was, God's government still had not been restored to this earth. Not yet. But that's coming. 
That is coming. It just took two generations. That tells you something about how hard man's heart is. That tells you something about the stubbornness of man, doesn't it? That in just two generations, look at what happened after Mr. Armstrong died in just one generation, not even one generation. It took just a few years, as we've been covering in doctrines recently, a few years for this surreptitious effort to undermine the the truth of God, to undermine the doctrines of God, it was all done according to a deceitful and evil and wicked plan. Lying, stealing, cheating, all those kinds of things that Satan just loves. That's the way of this world. It doesn't take long for us to get into Satan's way of thinking, which is why every day, I mean, we've got to be working at our spiritual lives. Acts 3 and verse 19, though, it says, Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That flood, remember, as Peter said, it typified our conversion to the truth, our baptism, our receipt of God's Spirit. God here says, repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That word refreshing there, it has to do with a revival. It has to do with life being brought to this earth. Verse 20 it says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. God's going to send his Son back to this earth. Jesus himself promised in John 14, 3, If I go, I'm coming again. And that's what Luke's writing about here in Acts 3. God will send his Son. Luke knew that. Luke believed it. Peter, that's why Peter was so filled with hope. Because he looked forward to this day. Jude wrote about it. The Apostle Jude, Paul did. 1 Thessalonians is devoted to it almost entirely. The return of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of it. Revelation 11. On and on it goes. Jesus says, I come quickly. I'm coming back. If I go, I'm coming again. Why? Why? Why is he going to return? What will he do on this earth? Look at verse 21. It says, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Restitution means a restoring of something that was taken away. Something that was taken away by Lucifer when he rebelled against God's authority. And now you go back to what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, how that when Jesus even preached to these fallen demons, he used the example of Noah and undoubtedly said, look at what happens after just a couple generations because of your way of thinking. Look at what happens to civilization. Look at what happens to societies. Your way of life does not work. God is sending his son back to this earth to restore his government, his family government, his family rule. Mr. Armstrong wrote, this is back in 1984, just a year, a little over a year before he died. He says, all this world's evil begins when human life begins. That's what God said in Genesis 8. It starts when they're little children. And the parents, because they're not doing their job, they just hand them over to the devil, basically. And the devil's there, just with his influence, constantly bombarding us as the prince of the power of the air, as Ephesians 2 says. All this world's evil begins when human life begins with children. Influences of the world around them, plus the invisible sway of Satan, causes varying degrees of selfishness and evil to develop as children grow into adults. He says, even after Christ comes to remove Satan and to bring in peace, prosperity, happiness, the process will have to begin with children. Children will have to be started out right. Adults will have to be de-educated, have to unlearn all the false knowledge, ideas, and philosophies they have before they can be taught the true way toward peace and successful and happy and useful lives. He says, utopia will not appear suddenly suddenly 
at the appearing of Christ. See, in the world tomorrow, it's going to start in the smallest of ways, not unlike the way it was in Noah's day. But the difference is Jesus Christ's government will be here, and there will be a small family like Noah's that will be blessed of God and that will take God's way of life and begin to spread it into families, into the lives of children. And as the families begin to get back on track, as the families are turned upside right, you could say, then we're going to see civilization, a civilization, a world that's totally, totally different than the one we see today. We are the beginning of that new world. We are the start of it. That's what's being raised up on this campus. And more important than that, that's what's being raised up and established in your life and in your family.